one. What's up, everyone? This is Nico and Irvin, and this is Shining Spotlight, the stream where we highlight creatives in the industry in order to inspire you guys. Today, we have a professional with a vast amount of prestige and knowledge of the anime and manga industry. He's a producer and columnist and longtime contributor of the anime industry, even back in the day, starting a fan subgroup called uh, Kadocha, uh, back when anime was scarcely available, you know, outside of Japan. He's a creator of a production company called Media OCD, and he is also the progenitor of the most credible and widely used source uh, for the industry's news and anime, Anime News Network. Today, we welcome the founder of Anime News Network, Justin Savakis. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming on. Thank you for coming, Justin. Thanks for having me, and uh, yeah, good to, good to finally talk to you guys. Likewise. Little, can you guys hear? Uh, the volume seems like it dropped from before, but uh, okay, this is I can still hear him a bit. Okay, good, good. Um, All right, so go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. So, uh, Justin, uh, before we really roll into it, uh, why don't you go ahead and tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Okay, well, uh, my name is Justin. I let's see, I started off as a VHS fan subber in like '96. Uh, which gives you some idea of how old I am. Uh, and then um, in 98, I started AnimeNewsNetwork.com. Uh, could not make it profitable and went over to its current owner, Chris McDonald, in uh, around 2000, 2001-ish. Uh, from there, I worked at Central Park Media. I was their first in-house video, in, uh, video editor. Um, they no longer exist, but they used to be one of the bigger names in anime publishing. Uh, from there, I did some stuff with um, uh, TV broadcast. I did some stuff with uh, web streaming. I did some stuff with theatrical. Um, I uh, basically learned a ton of stuff. I went back to Anime News Network. We tried to start their uh, streaming initiative. That didn't go so well. And um, But then I branched off into uh, Blu-ray offering, which I've always kind of had a passion for. And uh, now as a media OCD, I've produced Blu-rays mostly for discotheque media. That's so we do stuff for Anime Limited in the UK. Uh, we do stuff, uh, we've done a few uh, with uh, Bang Zoom uh, to do work with uh, Biz, Biz Media and Voyager and a couple other, uh, couple other big ones. And um, yeah, uh, we just, and uh, mo oh, most recently, oh wait, no, we can't talk about that one yet, but yeah, we have more coming. Okay, okay. Um... I, uh, I I did go ahead and see if I can manually uh, raise or, your mic volume, uh, but I had a little trouble hearing you. But I we caught a lot of what you said. Oh boy! Um, there we go. Yeah, oh, beautiful. So do you want me to yeah, do that? There, again? There we go. Oh, much better, yeah, much yeah. better. We can hear you. Okay. Did you, you need me to do that again? It, it seems like it's working right fine right now. So should okay. be good. Um, if you uh, if you want to go ahead, run your spiel again, just so we okay. get better quality. Okay, cool. Uh, my name is uh, Justin Sebakis, and I started off as a VHS fan subber back in the uh, olden days of uh, 1996. Um, from there, I started AnimeNewsNetwork.com in '98, um, and uh, could not make it profitable because I was 18 and it was 1998, and no one knew what they were doing on the internet yet. <laughs> and uh, so then I. Went off to New York City for college, and I started working in anime publishing. I started at uh, Central Park Media, who was uh, a, one of the bigger anime distributors at the time. Uh, then I went off and worked for a startup uh, TV broadcast slash home video distributor slash theatrical company that kind of hit the pavement. And uh, then I went back to Anime News Network, and then I started uh, Media OCD, which um, we make... Blu-rays for, uh, we've made Blu-rays for about uh, seven or eight different publishers now, but uh, mostly we're known for our work with Discotech Media and uh, Anime Limited in the UK. 
Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, I'm like, you know, it's funny when like you think about like the industry at large now, like you think about like how main or how how anime has pretty much kind of moved someone into the mainstream. But I think a lot of people don't know about like like those early beginnings, you know, when it was hard for people to actually get a hold of it. Like I hear we hear it all the time from like our mentor about like, yeah, we had to get it out the back of our uh, like basically out of someone's back trunk. You know what I mean? And, you know, we didn't grow up in that like me and like uh, Nico. But, you know, of course, you know, you uh, essentially, you know, like, for example, like yourself, you know, you guys were essentially bringing that to everyone when it wasn't available. It was, uh, it's a completely different world, I got to say. Uh, I was just kind of marveling. Uh, I just got an invitation in the mail to, well, invitation. It was a, you know, a fundraiser letter uh, for the uh, the new Academy, uh, Motion Picture Academy Museum here in LA. Mm -hmm. And they're opening with a Hayao Miyazaki exhibit. Oh, yeah. And I was like, uh, I just kind of looked at it. I'm like, I remember literally having to import and make illicit copies of that laser disc to get <laughs> its hockey stuff. And now it's literally the opening exhibition at the motion picture Academy museum. What planet do I live on? I know it's like, I'm like, it's crazy to think about, you know, like, you know, and what's interesting, like, you know, just from, you know, doing a little bit of like reading. So did you get your introduction to anime by, uh, basically like, you know, renting, um, I believe, uh, uh um, anime called project ako from blockbuster project ako yep uh okay. that was my first that was my gateway drug um and that that movie is mostly a parody and the parody just flew right over my head um but <laughs> it was such a crazy like hyper kinetic visually mind-blowing anime that was nothing like anything that was available here at the time just it just seemed like it was from another planet i i was deeply intrigued by it and uh i just kind of then rented everything i could possibly find and i just kind of got obsessed like i do and um from that point i just kept digging further and further and learning more and more and more and before i knew it it was my entire life and here i am 20 oh god 26 27 years later <laughs> and look at me now <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right man. So, uh, all right. So, 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 take us a little bit into like uh, what was it like starting an anime news network here. It's hard to even wrap your head around today because back then there was nothing. Like, it was hard to even find out new release dates for right. new coming out. Like, you you had no idea what was coming until like you went to Media Player or Sam Goody or whoever, and you just saw what was sitting there on the shelf and went, "Oh, what's this?" Um, there was no central clearinghouse to find out what new anime was coming out, what was happening, or even like what if like a creator died in Japan, we wouldn't know for months later and we'd hear about it on rumor, rumors on like news groups and things. So there was no central place to learn anything. I mean, we didn't even have Wikipedia. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, Google wasn't a thing. I'm I had to register <laughs> Anime News Network with freaking Alta, Alta Vista. <laughs> oh my um, gosh. Yeah, so wow. completely different planet and realizing that some there would have to be some sort of journalism source for people to get, you know, vetted information that wasn't just completely hearsay and rumor. Uh I had taken a literal one semester uh journalism class in high school and I'm like, well, that's not nothing and I I just started I registered the domain and I started the site this was so long ago i literally hand coded the html in a text editor uh for every single page wow. and um yeah i just uh i just started uh calling the the various anime publishers they i remember to this day the person i got passed to at what would later become the company i worked at central park media they're like who are you you're doing what <laughs> um like, who's trying to chronicleize this like well, it was just that that didn't exist. Like, wait, you're a news organization for anime, huh? Uh, so, so they but think you were um, like some kind of like just like fan, kind of like just <laughs> kind of just messing around, and like doing something, or like I'm sure they, I'm sure they did. But that that's kind of what anime is, and still kind of is to an extent. I mean, the the anime fan scene or the anime scene in general in the United States has always been 
just this kind of parade of overzealous fans getting it over their head and they either figure it out or they don't. Um, and luckily I sort of figured it out or I kept figuring it out enough that I was able to keep going. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many fans I've met over the years that have tried to ask my advice or tried to do things, something lofty, and then they just completely get in over their heads and then they just end up completely burying themselves and embarrassing themselves and it just all blows up in their face and we never hear from them again. I was dumb enough to stick around. Oh, man. Uh, okay, so because uh, I've heard about this before, uh, actually many times, uh, especially speaking with uh, some of the older folks that, uh, that 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 were able to see that kind of the transition and some of the high periods of uh, of like OG manga at the time, uh, especially with the difficulty of getting anything, any information over in America. Yeah, um, typically having to re even resort to like bootleg stuff. Uh, so, uh, if I if I read correctly, uh, there is actually like a gap period between the time you were uh, you were initially at Anime News Web Network and uh, when you came back to it, you were oh, yeah. for about a year or over a year. Um, so yeah, I started in Anime News Network in '98, and the reason I actually started it was because, all right, so I grew up. Um, where are you guys based? We're actually based in uh, Detroit. So no, no kidding. Now, yeah, I was gonna say I think you're based. Yeah. In, you, you were based in Detroit. All right. Today, right? So I grew up in Troy and went to Birmingham schools, <laughs> which is why I hate people. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, uh, and y you know how it is there. Like you, it, you realize that there are other colleges, but everyone either talks about Michigan State or, or University of Michigan. Oh yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. My, my sister went to Michigan State. You know, yeah. So, yeah I know what you mean. <laughs> and I, you know, being kind of a intellectual dweeby type, I of course wanted to go to Michigan. Um, and that was the year they won the Rose Bowl, so everyone wanted to go to Michigan. And I got waitlisted, and I ended up at Michigan State. And I immediately realized I did not fit in there at all, and that my social life would be just dead on arrival. So. Um, yeah, I started Anime News Network, not just because, you know, we needed it, because it was something I wanted, but um, it was just, I, I was just not having anything else to do, because I was just going to be bored out of my mind there. Um, and so it didn't, I lasted one semester there, it was a disaster, but at least I had that to, to pour my time into. Um, but then the next year, my dad found me a school in New York City called School of Visual Arts because I was a you know film nerd and they had a pretty decent film program. And I was just like, this is an option? And he's like, yeah, yeah, it is. And so when I went to New York, it was, I tried to keep ANN going, but it was um, becoming less and less of a priority because yes, I had suddenly had access to this whole world of anime and of industry that I didn't have access to before. On the other hand, I actually really wanted to be a part of it. I didn't really want to be a journalist. Um, and I ended up meeting John O'Donnell, the owner of Central Park Media, on a plane. Um, completely dumb luck. Uh, I was supposed to sit behind him, and the guy that was supposed to sit next to him asked to trade. And I went, wow, okay, I know who that is, so yes, yes, I will. We ended up talking each other's ear off the entire flight, and we got to... Uh, we land before we landed, he'd offer me a job, and I'm like, oh, I'm nice. taking that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, hey, how would you like to pursue, you know, like basically a career in something you've always wanted to do? It's like, <laughs> right? Well, so the, the funny thing is, I was on their screener list, and uh, yeah, that they, they literally sent me a UPS box every month when I was living at my parents' house of all their new releases for that month. Inevitably, there'd be a couple tapes that were just like not just hentai, but like terrible hentai, like drawn with someone's left hand hentai. Oh um, <laughs> and I remember my mom wanting to be, wanting to be supportive and just going, just keep it in your room. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I got off the plane, I called my mom. I'm like, you'll never guess what happened. I've got, I just got a job at Central Park Media. And she's like, that's great, honey. Wait a minute. Did she realize what you were talking about when you said it? Or? They, well, she's she she did say it's like well, they knew she knew they were the company that put out Grave of the Fireflies, but also the company. And then she went, "Isn't that the company that just keeps sending you that really terrible porn?" And I'm just like, "Yes." She goes, "Oh." 
<laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, so that that job, I was three years at Central Park Media, and I was alternating between working on like really, really great stuff. I got to work on Pat Labor. I got to work on uh, a Project ACO re-release for the first time. Um, got to work on a ton of great stuff. And then I'd have to switch gears and work on like night shift nurses. Um, I learned a lot. Let's just put it that like that. And, you know, part of my soul died, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> So wait, did you, you said you mentioned how you worked on like basically like the release or re-release for uh, Project AKO. Like, was that uh, yep. you know, did, I, I guess did that feel like a surreal moment for you at that time? Just because it's like, oh, this is what got me started, you know, like on my whole anime. At journey. the time, yes, it blew my mind because I was just like, this is really cool. And of course, I want, I love that movie, and I wanted to pour everything I had into it. Um, that what I was able to do at that time and what was technically possible uh was very different we were very dependent on um outside production vendors because uh, you know that that was the very beginning of being able to do video on a com on a normal computer uh so most of that stuff had to be hired away to companies with like huge multi-million dollar production facilities um that said i i was pretty jazzed to work on it Little did I know that my whole career would then be all these weird circles where I just end up circling back and we, we working on the same shows over and over and over again. I think I worked on ACO. This will be the fourth time I'm working on it right now. Oh, wow. Really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, that's interesting. Hopefully, you know. the last time. This is, you know, I can't, I don't think we can do it any better than we are right now. <laughs> and tell us the fifth and then it's the sixth time. <laughs> oh my god you know so like with obviously being involved with the process of doing this like did you ever have to because i'm this is something i'm not aware of if, if if you have have to basically know this or or not i'm sure it probably helps but did you ever have to basically learn like uh the japanese language and you know um basically use that in any of your daily you know interactions you know with anybody you know in regards to like any of the releases, or especially with the fan subs, obviously. Like, well, know. any good nerd needs to know Japanese. Um, I'm terrible at it. Uh, I do know enough to get around in, in Japan and such. Um, and, you know, make a couple highly embarrassing phone calls to just, you know, get through the, the receptionist over there. Um, but uh, it's... I'm not great at it. Uh, <laughs> The, luckily, almost everyone working in the international department of the various companies in Japan knows English enough to at least communicate. So um, that's it's really not for what I do. It, it's kind of optional. Interesting. OK, OK. Yeah, I'm like, cause I, I knew it like I was like, you know what, somewhere in there, I'm like, I'm just kind of wondering. I was like that if that's really a thing, because I think everybody has like that perception. Like, if you do this, you're going to have to know it, you know, but it's obviously I guess it just really depends on what you're doing. Right, exactly. If you're actually over there trying to work on anime, actually making it, that's a completely different ballgame. That you need to know Japanese for. But if you're working on the U.S. side of it, everyone working in the international department at the major anime companies, they know English. Interesting. Okay, okay. That said, it always helps because, you know, inevitably you'll run into something that they don't understand or there's some sort of language barrier or they'll try to do something that they think they know the English and they don't very well. And you're just like, no, 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 we can't call it that. That means this, you know, so stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Like the localization of it, basically, so that it actually, you know, it's not sounding like, you know, weird, you know, essentially like how you may have had some really old dubs that um, didn't correctly or didn't really sound i don't know what the right word would be but basically they didn't translate well well i mean old dubs tend to be the opposite problem uh back in the day when that when you know anime was being released on vhs and you know early dvd era um it wasn't possible for japan to really closely supervise what was being done in in the u.s and other countries to localize things um and so Often it was just the, the whatever studios that were working on it here working in a bubble, and there there was they couldn't really 
research much or they couldn't really ask things and there was just no back and forth and as a result you had some really weird choices and people just making shit up to like try to flesh out a story or some or a presentation as, as they imagined it should sound uh so that was kind of a whole different ball game it was very very rare that japan was directly involved in uh in localization until probably around 2005 ish Yeah, so uh, in regards to uh, back to uh, that 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 period between uh, 1999 and 2008, um, what was it like? Uh, really, uh, before before you got back into it in 2008, uh, what was it? What was it like trying to basically? Uh, because uh, I know you said you were trying to uh, you were working with seat or the central central, uh, central park central media park. yeah and on top of that uh getting back into anime news network like what 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 strings had to happen to like come back to it because you mentioned you didn't really you you didn't really want to be a part of it as far as like being a journalist per se right okay but, so uh, let me explain how that whole loop back happened mm -hmm. uh so central park media while i was there was clearly on the decline and the hentai you know we weren't getting normal hentai we were getting like the really really dark misogynistic hentai and also uh, like i'm gay i'm not into that stuff to begin with and then the really really dark like violent hentai on top of that i'm like yeah. Yeah, no, just no. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it goes there. Yeah. Oh, uh, so I just like um, after a while, I I had enough, and I could see the writing on the wall as far as where the anime company was going. So I just decided there was a startup at the time called Imagine Asian TV, and it was basically trying to be um, BET for Asians. Oh. And, uh, but they didn't really have a good idea of what that meant. They couldn't figure out if it was for Asian, like first or second generation Asian Americans, or if it was just people that were into Asian pop culture or both. And they, they, uh, they were trying to just pander to way too many audiences and they just, it was a really badly run company. <laughs> it was a real, <laughs> that, that company was a shit show. Um, that, that said, uh, I was their only video engineer, um, and I got to do everything. I got to learn everything. I got. They were trying to do theatrical releases, so I had to learn about how to strike a theatrical print. I had to ha learn how to release an MPAA certified uh, trailer on 35 millimeter. They tried to run two movie theaters, one in New York and one in LA. Uh, I had to learn how you know movie theater build out works. How um the uh automation in a movie theater works this was still the tail end of the 35 millimeter so i had to learn about building out the projection and all that good stuff um the actual linear broadcast i had to learn about master control i had to learn about the playout servers i had to learn about uh satellite uplink um i got to do a lot of really cool nerdy things um meanwhile the company Three years, thirty million dollars later, had almost nothing to show for it. It was a shit show. Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, yeah, they did not know thing, what they didn't get there. And technically, all that stuff, I was, I wasn't even a video engineer there. My job was licensing shit. <laughs> They're like Justin, you do it. You handle this for us. Like, run this I, place I mean, for us. When <laughs> I when I quit, everyone else is just like, oh well, we're fucked. <laughs> 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 oh. Man. By the way, I, I have to apologize. I'm kind of losing the light here. I've uh, I am literally in my as you probably noticed, mm -hmm. I'm in the car in a parking lot. Uh, so like, just, no, if, it's fine. if my picture gets really dim, that's what's happening. <laughs> Sun's going down. It's fine. It is fine. You know. Um, interesting. I'm like so like I guess like because I mean I did read a little bit about you know uh, about that of course you know or I should say I listened to a little bit of you know some interviews or whatever you were, kind of were talking about it a little bit back then. Yeah. Uh, but well you know, it was interesting because that was around the time of the anime crash. Uh, that's when you know ADV was going down the toilet. That's when Genion was going down the toilet. Uh, and because all of those companies were in flailing mode and 
the uh, imagination really needed anime programming because that was one of the only things from Asia that anyone actually gave a shit about. Um, I was able to strike all these amazing deals. I was able to get like all this really, really good anime for like sometimes as little as like a couple hundred bucks an episode. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and nice. well, the nice thing is that Japan thinking of all of this anime programming, it's supposed to be television programming. They wanted nothing more than to get it on television, even at a podunk uh, piece of crap cable network that nobody got. Um, they'd take it. you know. So we were able to get those deals through, and I was able to get some really, really good stuff that way and forge some good connections. So one of the last things I got to do there was um, the anime studio TMS, uh, they have an office here in, in LA and, uh, they had, they had a guy at the time named Andy Berman, who's uh, this super awesome guy. And he was able to work with me to make a branded block on imagination where, uh, it was called TMS anime classics. And we were able to take three kind of classic TMS shows, which was, uh, cat's eye, um, nobody's boy, Remy and Orgus. And we're, I subtitled them for the first time, and we're going to put them out on uh, Burn On Demand DVD through this third-party company. Well, that turned into an absolute disaster. The third-party company ended up not paying anybody. Um, we sold maybe a couple hundred copies through Right Stuff. Nobody wanted to order direct because they didn't trust them uh, to order direct, so we had to sell through Right Stuff, and that took half the, half the revenue. Um, it didn't go well, but it forged the connection. And since imagina imagination was spiraling the drain anyway, uh, by the time I got out, I still had the good connection with TMS and imagination was the company that was just not following through on anything. So it was fine. <laughs> it was just like, all right, you guys can do, do your thing. You know, yeah. <laughs> like I'm jumping ship. I'm saving myself. <laughs> well, I can't, I like there, I could, I don't want to distract uh, from this conversation, but I have so many stories of just absolute stupidity from that network. It is, it was just absolute amateur hour. Um, and of the rank and file employees, there was not a single person that thought anybody in management knew what they were doing and they were right. <laughs> Interesting. Like, have you run into any of those? I mean, obviously you, you, I'm like, I know you, you know, wouldn't name any names or anything like that, but have you ran into any of those people like still in the industry? Or are they still involved with the industry at all? Or? Um, some are, some aren't. Most of the, uh, absolute dumpster fires are no longer in the, in the industry. Um, there's a few people that, uh, actually there's quite a few people that I'm still friends with, uh, and my direct boss in licensing at Imagination, David Chu, he now runs a little company called Digital Media Rights, which, who's having phenomenal success these days with, uh, companies like Retro Crush and um, yeah, I know about Retro Crush. That's yeah, like. there. He he's he was like honestly, he was the only executive of that company I actually respected, and I'm I couldn't be happier to see him doing well these days. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. You know, um, last time we had dinner, we basically just kind of spent the entire night laughing at how dumb that company was. <laughs> you know, before we move on to like the um, the uh, second half of this. Uh, uh, interview really quickly we want to um, go ahead and just make a quick big shout out to the honeycomb hideout you know we're going to see that up on the screen right there the honeycomb hideout is actually a podcast think of it as howard stern for geeks it's a part of the imaginos workshop line you know we're all a part of that so shining otaku was a part of that as well you definitely want to go ahead and take a listen to that podcast it's on spotify you can listen to it you know, usually the podcast lasts about an hour or so, you know, very good. Listen again, Howard Stern for Geeks is basically uh, what you get out of this podcast. Very raw. Anyway, let's just jump back into it. Okay. <laughs> so um, I'm kind of curious more so about like, okay, so now nowadays, of course, you have companies like, um, for example, like Crunchyroll, mm. who, you know, are very big. They're, you know, they're well known or whatnot. Like, and I would think, you know, at least from, this is kind of using my own knowledge, you know, or at least from what I remember, Crunchyroll was kind of starting to kind of go up on its incline around like 2008 or nine, or that's when it started at least, it at yep. least appeared on the scene, you know, yes. um, like, did, were you aware of Crunchyroll at the time or, you know, like what was the, oh yeah. So around then, so the anime bubble burst in 06, 07. Okay. And the reason that bubble burst was a couple reasons. First of all, 
there was no way at the time for fans to watch stuff without buying it legally. Uh, like basically the expectation, if you're going to be a good fan, an ethical fan was you had to buy DVDs sight unseen. And if you turned out to not like the show, that was, you know, you're just screwed. Um, there was very little in the way of broadcast uh, television. There was very little in the way of um, legal streaming. And uh, basically, everyone was just resorting to fan subs because fan subs, A, they would hit the scene a good year before any legal release could happen. And then there was, um, there was the whole issue with, you know, what if you didn't like it? Um, there was just so much content out there that you could just spend thousands and thousands of dollars and just have a giant pile on your wall of stuff you didn't even like. Um, so this was a huge problem, and uh, fans were quickly turning away from the legal releases because it just didn't work for them anymore. That that model of consuming content just was not suited towards uh, what anime fans wanted. Um, and so when Crunchyroll came along, they... Yes, they started as a as an illicit site where people could just upload fan subs, but the minute they got venture capital and they tried to actually do it right, they spent thousands of dollars and worked really hard trying to convince the Japanese rights holders that this is the next step. This is what you needed to do is you needed to be able to stream stuff legally and in a timely manner, um, ideally fairly close to Japanese broadcast date. Um, and Japan was, they knew there was a problem, but they really needed a kick in the pants to kind of get in that direction. And Anime News Network, we tried to do that, the same thing too. We thought, you know, hey, we were one of the biggest anime websites in the English speaking world. Why not? Why would fans not stick around to watch the anime there too? So we tried to license stuff too. But unfortunately, being a tiny mom and pop website, we just didn't have that sort of uh, capital to invest in, in the streaming infrastructure. And we got a couple simulcasts, but it, did, it didn't go well. And we ended up just kind of, you know, washing our hands of it. Um, but Crunchyroll, they were actually able to make it work. They got actual investment from TV Tokyo. And, you know, the, the big, big 800 pound gorilla in anime at the time was Naruto. Oh, and no. they were able to get Naruto simulcast. Uh, which was the biggest coup you could possibly imagine, because Naruto, they were getting millions of torrent downloads every week. Millions. I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of ashamed to say. Granted, I didn't torrent it, but I can say that I'm like, yeah, I was in that community that watched it online back in the day. Well, look, you had to, you had to, and you know, for Crunchyroll to get that legally, that was a coup. That was a, you know, if if ever there was a killer app for anime, it was Naruto. Um, so yeah, that's um, they. Once they had Naruto, we knew that there was just it was game over. They were they were going to be super successful no matter what. Oh yeah. Actually, uh, speaking of uh, these animes, this, this international animes and uh, how it affected the fans, uh, what, what's what's your what's your opinion uh, actually on the uh, OEL community, uh, original English language uh, manga fans? Um, in terms of like original manga being made by non-Japanese people and calling it manga, right, right? Um, I don't have a strong opinion of it. I, for me, anime will always be stuff made by Japanese creators and manga will always, always be stuff made by Japanese creators. So mm -hmm. it's basically, to me, it's not manga. It's, it's people, it, it's comics being made in manga form but not actually manga um and right. there are we have the term right i mean it um you know i feel like from the very earliest stages of anime and manga taking off in the states we had americans going well how do i how do i leverage the huge fan base of anime and manga the very passionate fan base so i can get them involved in my shit and um, I don't think that is the point. I think that the whole point of being into um, the Japanese stuff is that it is from a different point of view. It's creative from 
someone else's point of view that is not one that we necessarily consider every day in, in the States. Um, and so for me, you know, no diminishment of the quality of, of some of that storytelling of, you know, the, the, um, you know, the Avatar the Last Airbenders and the, uh, yeah, and, you know, the, and of the uh, Castlevanias um, and, you know, all the other stuff that's sort of made in anime or manga style. Um, I, for me personally, as a fan, I'm not interested because the whole point isn't the art style. The whole point isn't the, um, it, it isn't the story you know, storytelling style or whatever you think that means for me, the point of the point of being into this stuff is that it is not part of the ecosystem that I'm expected to take part in. It's something different. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So, uh, I, I know you're, uh, I know you're losing a lot of light here. Uh, you know, it's, it's fine. It's just darkness. I'll just talk to you. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, I, I, I can get to, uh, some of, some of the, uh, later questions sooner, uh, sooner rather than later here, uh, just, just for the, uh, convenience. Um, I, I have, I have my, uh, my overhead light on, so, you know, that's, okay, that's okay. I'll just talk to you like I'm telling a ghost story or something. <laughs> oh, man, once here. upon a time. You know. <laughs> <laughs> we had to pirate our anime on VHS. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, so many uh, anime fans out there are like, what are you talking about? I, I just They're dark days, dark days. <laughs> oh my gosh! So there's a lot of people in the uh, in our community here, basically fans of manga who want who basically want to be creators and whatnot in this industry. Uh, basically, OEL creators mm. who uh, who 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 want to who want to do that, who, who basically want to get on stations like yours or do what you did, uh, run, running these studios, do, do, uh, put out content, uh, work with Japanese studios, uh, and by any means necessary, like, uh, hearing your input on it is actually, uh, really, really helpful for them. What, I mean, what specifically would you advise, uh, for anybody aspiring in that direction? Well, look, as, as as everyone likes to say, but nobody really seems to fully digest what it means. Uh, anime and manga are mediums, not genres. Um, you can, you can call your stuff anime or manga. Um, but the very fact that you're not Japanese will not, will almost by necessity mean that a lot of people won't be interested in it. And a lot of people that you're expecting to get into it aren't interested in it. From my point of view, look, I went to film school. My eventual goal is to tell my own stories. Um, I don't, I can't draw worth anything. So it's not like I'm, I want to be an animator. Um, but if you want to tell your story, tell your story in the medium that comes easiest for you because creating anything especially anything of quality is insanely difficult um so i think adding that additional barrier to well then i have to learn japanese well then i have to move to another country that is very difficult for foreigners to live in and then i have to get a job at a company that might not really take me seriously and pays me absolute garbage and then i need to wait work my way up that ladder um, and spend years in poverty so I can get a chance to tell the story I wanted to. Or you can just write a novel or draw a graphic novel and stop calling it something that's a medium from a different country. It's just a name. Tell your story. That's, you know, that's the important thing. But, but, Justin, like, what? what What about the uh, what about the the guys that really want to do manga? And, you know, they they love the way it's it's done, the style and everything. They they like I can't do that in the comic form. The Western form is it's, it's just you know it's not there. It's not expressive. It's, it's not functioning. Well, look, I mean, 
art style is a whole nother thing. You can, I, I don't know any uh, up and coming sequential artist or um, animator that hasn't been made in, incredibly influenced by uh, Japanese art style. Um, but just because it's influenced by the art style doesn't mean it has to be manga or has to be anime. Um, if we're talking about manga in that it's serialized in a weekly magazine in Japan, we're also talking about stuff that has a lot of pressure from those editorial people that it should follow certain tropes, that it should appeal to a certain demographic, that the character arc should be a certain way. That's what manga actually means. Um, I think coming at it from an American point of view, we have kind of this skewed, I idealized notion of what anime and manga actually is. And, you know, those kids in Japan, they're not, you know, that's a, those are difficult jobs and they have their own difficulties that we have not anticipated. Um, so I think a lot of Western fans ideas of what is anime and what it is to be a storyteller in that medium and what is manga and what it's like to be a storyteller in that medium I don't think they fully understand what that means. And then to apply that label to their own stuff, um, I don't know. I find that presumptuous. I really do. Um, just make your make your stuff. It, 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 you don't have to pretend to be from another culture. If, the, if your culture is, if your stuff is influenced by another culture, that's great. That's wonderful. Um, but, you know, I... I don't want to tell people what to do. I don't want to say, you know, hey, you're not this because, you know, who knows? You might end up uh, being like um, uh, one of one of the handful of of American artists that actually do get published in a Japanese serialized magazine or something. But the odds of that happening are fairly low to almost zero. It's just true. It's it's that's just the reality of things. Um, the question is, do you want to find an audience for your work? If you want to find an audience, great. There's an audience. Um, I'm just saying don't make things unnecessarily hard for yourself by calling it something that it might not necessarily be. Yeah, so one of the issues we find uh, commonly in the OEO community is uh, is actually the notion of... Uh, of, of differentiating the, co the culture with originality mm -hmm. uh, in your own work. Uh, a lot of the fan base, like, like you said, uh, like to basically, you know, use manga in its entirety with the tropes and everything and uh, and uh, bit taken away from stuff that's basically part of another person's culture and not developing their own story, their own experiences in their work. You know, when I was at Anime News Network, we would get pitches from from wannabe manga creators or or whoever and of course almost all of them they're just like oh i just want to be the ideas guy i'm like okay first of all not a job <laughs> uh you know the the guy that just comes up with ideas that's not a thing um second of all the their idea sometimes which they'd like map out in incredible detail with like episode listings of uh, what would happen when and also, it was inevitably be some variation on magical high school, Harry Potter ish, with some Naruto and some Bleach and some you know, it, it, and the Shonen Jump Jump stuff. It was almost always just like those three ingredients, throw them in a blender, and it's that. Um, and it's just like okay. surely you have a story to tell <laughs> surely you have some something in you that is unique that only you can can bring to the table that you can share about your life experience willing to bet a large amount of money this is not it exactly but you know that, that everyone starts off somewhere and you know a, Everyone, you know, in their youth, um, you know, has has the idea of basically being like the people that inspire them. And that's, you know, that is a wonderful thing. And I don't want to discourage that. Um, but how do we transfer that into something 
into original thought. That's a hard one. I, I haven't cracked that that puzzle. Yeah, that that is a that is a hard uh, a hard puzzle to crack. Um, sorry for the technical difficulty there, uh, but we got Urban back in here. Yay! <laughs> but uh, I mean, you know, kind of rolling into uh, actually really rough. quick. I actually have a quick question. So, Go ahead. like, you have. We've even had, I don't know if you've heard like Miyazaki's kind of gone on record before about uh, complaining about like the current day uh, industry, you know, when it comes to anime mm. and, you know, kind of like the lack of, of like storytelling. And it kind of sounds, you know, I'm thinking about kind of based on what you just said, like, how do you feel about like current day anime, like the anime industry in terms of what comes out versus maybe what came out like in the earlier days back when it was out of, you know, your back trunk, basically? You know, back uh, in the 80s, you know, the 90s. It's really, really easy to glorify the past um, because the stuff that we remember from the 80s and 90s and early 2000s is the good stuff. And the amount of crap that came out back then was insane. Uh, there, there was so much garbage. Um and the stuff that we remember now is uh, all of the stuff that was not garbage. So it's always tempting to look back and go, hey, man, it was so much better back then. Um, we have a lot more anime now, uh, and we get everything that Japan makes, virtually everything, almost day and day. And so we get all the crap. Um, and a lot of that stuff never would even get imported over here before. Um, and, you know, to this day, companies like Discotech, when they look at, old shows that they never brought over if there's if it's not like a very clear genre like mecca where like vintage mecca where there's a, a clear fan base for it um if it's just a show that never really got fans of never really got a release here never got traction here chances are even discotech's going to pass on that because you know there was just there's just not an audience for it um and just like that there's not really an audience for a good half of what Japan makes now. Um, honestly, I don't swim too much in the current release waters. I basically wait a few years because there's just so much of it. And I'm such a workaholic. I spend so much time in the anime yeah. I'm actually working on. Um, I'll wait a few years and, and whatever people are still talking about two or three years later, then I'll go back and watch. Um, also, I have a very soft spot in my heart for sports anime. Which is funny because I hate sports, but you know, as I like to say, I know more about Japanese high school baseball than I know about the NBA. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, said, your slam dunks. You know, yeah, that was, that was the same with me with Prince of Tennis. <laughs> yeah, like like I got so 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 into Haikyuu most recently, and I'm just like, I know a lot about Japanese high school volleyball now. I know literally nothing about professional volleyball. Literally nothing. And you know what? I could literally go. I, I live in Los Angeles. I could literally drive to Manhattan Beach and watch the volleyball championship for free if I wanted. Do I care? No, not really. Wow. It, it works like that. It does. So do you think that... Like, do you think that the... Like, I think recently Sony, you know, they bought both you know they have both crunchy roll and funimation yeah you know and that kind of creates somewhat of like or at least i would, i would perceive like a monopoly like do you think that that's good for the industry uh no but it's not fatal here's why japan hates it um they're Japan was able to create, you will get a lot more money for their content by playing mommy against daddy and, you know, having Crunchyroll and Funimation out, try to outbid each other for new projects. Um, and they can't do that anymore. So <laughs> they're not happy about it. Um, you know, Netflix is coming in trying to get some anime, but they honestly, they kind of tend to go around the whole production committee system and just kind of develop their own stuff. They don't, they don't really kind of play ball like the rest of the anime companies do. 
Um, I think there'll be a lot more investment into Sentai and High Dive. Um, I think there'll probably be more attention paid to, to companies like uh, Digital Media Rights and Retro Crush. Um, and I think, you know, you know, the Japanese side of the business is very smart and, you know, the, the international distribution side of things is very important to them now. I mean, a good 50% of anime revenues are coming from international sources now. It's not just the domestic Japanese market that matters. So they'll figure out something. And in the meantime, for consumers, it's pretty great because they get most of their anime from one source. So um, while it's not ideal, I don't think it's something that fans really need to concern themselves with right now. I think it's just something they need to pay attention to because, you know, I don't think they will be allowed to stay dominant, as dominant as they currently are combined for, for that long, maybe another two or three years till Japan figures out another method to get more money. Yeah, I can see that. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, you know, they, they're, um, you know, they, they're doing their own dubbing like they always have. They've been hiring out like they always have. Uh, you know, increasingly they're, they're having uh, other dubbing studios do their, their English production. Um, you know, as long as they keep doing everything competently, I don't see a real problem from the fan point of view. Yeah, so the... Um, we are at the... Uh, or a, little, a minute over the... Uh, the final 10 minute uh, marker here. Um, gosh, there actually were a few more questions here, but um, I can stay on. You don't, I'm not under any time limit as long as you're fine with my dark, dark picture. <laughs> I would really greatly appreciate it. Um, it's well, I, made, like, I made you guys wait, so it's only fair. No, it, it, it's, um, no, it's just the, uh, the time limit for the, uh, for the episodes we, we do this, how we, how we run the roster. Oh, um, okay. Uh, they're, they're, we try to keep them at an hour, hour long, but um, I'll fit one more in. Uh, so I, I, make it easy, for, you know, for everyone to be able to listen in. <laughs> so before before we get to the money questions, then um, I I did want I did want your thoughts real quick on. Uh, Oh, I, I'll, I'll let you pick ICV2 or the pandemic. ICV2 or the pandemic? Wait, I, I'll let you pick. I'll let you pick. I'll let you pick. Which one you want me to? Oh, finish? I mean, we all have thoughts on the pandemic. I'm not sure I can I give you anything all that interesting. And as far as ICV2, they're just a uh, they're another news source, and they're a pretty good one. Uh, very well funded, and very mm -hmm. well organized. Uh, I don't I don't think I have anything all that controversial to say about either one. That, that, no, that, that, that's fine, actually. Uh, in, in the case of ICV2, um, I actually, you know, considering that, you know, uh, especially to, uh, especially the folks like myself uh, in the uh, OEL community, they're one of the, uh, they're um, much like Anime News Network, they're, they're like one of the big sources of information. Mm, yeah, uh, they're great for finding uh, various uh, information on, uh, not so much just at uh, not so much anime, but like trying to center it in on like a, a lot of the manga circulating around in the uh, OEO community, and uh, and even going as far as like you know statistics on the business aspect of, of a lot of things going on uh, stocks even. Uh, so I I did yeah I was curious about your opinion on uh, on their agenda. icv 2s agenda is basically comic books. Um, and sequential art as as a business, um, and I think in terms of how comics have traditionally worked in America, they have their finger on the pulse. They're they are better researched, better connected than pretty much any other journalism source. Um, that said, as one of those people, they they do have a vested interest in how things have traditionally worked. So, um, you know, obviously they are going to be very concerned with the traditional comic book shops, the traditional uh, Diamond Comics supply chain, um, and 
all that stuff and also kind of keep and keep track of what goes through major bookstore chains and things like that they track big business because they are a big business trade publication um they're naturally not going to be as dialed into alternative press and you know trying to um how can i put this they're not going to be as cognizant of things that are not yet big business. How about that? That makes perfect sense. Yeah. That, that's just a part and parcel of being a trade publication. Yeah, because uh, I do see them more so being oriented on pro like projections of, of, uh, of what's already out there versus you know, things that are wonky. Well, I mean, you have to remember who their audience actually, their intended audience actually is. You know, plenty of re people read ICB2, but they're, the audience that they're trying to reach are professionals in the retail space and in the, um, and, and in the publication space. So that's, that's going to be who their, their content is geared to, not necessarily the fans and not necessarily up and coming creators. So that um that actually not to say that you would be but you know in case you are uh this is a good segue into uh, one of our popular questions on the show okay. uh do you have uh any rivals friendly competitions uh anybody that uh you you were in a competition with in this industry oh that's an interesting question uh, <laughs> um I don't think so. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been in this business for God, 23 years now. Um, as far as post video, post-production people, um, I might be the only Blu-ray guy that people actually know the name of and have actually had fans harass publishers into trying to use my services. <laughs> that, that is insane to me. And I'm very grateful but that's also insane. Uh, Very. Th there are a handful of other people that I actually I know that. It's a little that, OCD, right? Well, you know, I think, <laughs> honestly, the just the fact that I'm um, very visible and I have been very visible and I also, like, kind of very publicly have very high ideals as far as, like, quality goes. Um, I honestly don't think my discs are substantially better than most other publishers. Um, and honestly, as far as production and as far as like encoding quality and things like that i don't i'm not doing anything special um my team really really cares i really really care especially with like really high profile titles that we kind of go nuts and pour our hearts and souls into i mean oh my god project aco this this re-release i'm losing my mind <laughs> like we've been working on this for over a year and we're just kind of pushing it over the finish line now and everyone that's touched it has lost at least two weeks of their lives down a toilet because like we just keep something keeps happening uh but there's not a whole lot of other publishers that will a fight these battles and b openly talk about them um and i think because we can openly talk about them and because discotech has been so amazing about letting us be open with the with the fans people appreciate what we do a lot more uh, and I think that's unique and I, I really, I really appreciate that because we get to share what we're doing and the fans get to, uh, share some of their knowledge and, uh, we've actually had fans help contribute to this disc, uh, and various other discs that we've been in production on. Um, so as far as rivals go, no, I can't really think of one. We're just trying to do the best we can with, uh, the stuff that we're given and, um, we're honored to be able to keep doing that. Nice, nice. Now I'm like, I like to hear that. You know, it's just the question that we always have to ask. You know what I mean? Because like everybody, I feel like it's like always a varying answer. I have some people that say, "Oh, I don't like, like, why would I ever have a rival? Like, I'm the best." Like, I've actually we've had that before. You know? Okay, well, <laughs> that, <laughs> that that's a very like shown and jump answer to that. Yeah, exactly. And no, I agree, you know. Well, I mean, the, the thing is, like, if you don't have any direct competition, I mean, we're our own competition. We've we put out some insane discs. Have you seen our, our disc of Castle Caliostro? I have not, personally. No, actually. 
okay, well, that disc has, I think, seven audio tracks and five subtitle tracks. Oh, wow. That's actually quite a bit right there. Right. Uh, we have three different English dubs on that. We have, um, including a, a new version that was made specifically for us, um, like that disc is insane. And it's now, we have now topped ourselves maybe four or five times in terms of, of just weird stuff that we've been able to do. We, our, our disc of Robot Carnival actually recuts and rearranges itself three different ways. I love Robot Car Carnival. I love it. <laughs> Thank I you. Yeah. We, and then we just were like, oh, we should do that in 4K. So we just did a 4K release. Uh, um, you by know, the way, funny. I was actually introduced to that um, by, um, I don't know if you've ever watched like, um, like the app, like Pluto TV. You know, and they had like a station that had like robot. I'm like, I saw robot carnival. I'm like, interesting. I'm like, okay. You know, and then I looked it up. I'm like, I don't know why I never knew about this. I mean, I know about like a lot of like, you know, of course, a lot of the older stuff, a lot of the cyberpunk stuff, but. Right. I mean, it, it's just, I love just having it on the background at parties because it's so pretty and it makes people go, what is that? Most definitely. I can, I can understand that just like the aesthetics of it and everything. I, you could tell like there was like a real love for i'm not saying that people don't have a love for it now but like you know it was less commercial i feel like back in the day with certain you know works that came out you're not wrong um my favorite th okay my favorite thing about anime back in the day is how the industry itself was so poorly developed and that if something wasn't specifically for television um, and had a sponsor breathing down his neck, and even some in some cases, if it was, the creators were kind of left to just do whatever they wanted. It, they, it was just kind of such this backwater of, of the entertainment industry that they just had no adult supervision. And that's some of my favorite stuff because we just got crazy shit that there's nothing like and half of it just doesn't work it doesn't hold up as a story but the other half of it is like oh my god how do they get away with doing this and i i miss that stuff because i don't think that's possible anymore oh yeah you know what's before we even get into our final question i have to ask because like i ended up finding this out too like sure. you've interviewed uh otomo before right i have that was not not the best interview but he's since made it <laughs> Well, like, I guess, what was that experience like, like meeting him before? I guess that's what I'm kind of curious about, like how that went. Mm, it wasn't great. Uh, well, okay, so Otomo was in LA because um, you remember that uh, that anthology film short piece. Um, I yeah, think so yeah. Yeah. Okay, so there was one short in that that he actually directed himself. Um, I forget the name of it, but it's about the the girl that accidentally lights the village on fire. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and there was, uh, there, there's a theater downtown that's associated with CalArts that was having, like, kind of an Otomo night, and they had him in town and just, just kind of celebrate him and, and that sort of thing. And he was in town for that. And through Anime News Network, they were able to get um, an interview scheduled with him, and they, they sent me. And I was only, like, I think I was only writing Answer Man at the time. I was my, most of my job was already media OCD, but I was happy to do it because I'm like, hey, Otomo. Um, so I get down there, and it's an early morning thing, and he's surrounded by his just phalanx of of um, industry people and and you know managers and all, all that stuff, and all they care about is breakfast. And every question I have like this long list of full film and. I get to like, I, I'm I'm kind of working through his filmography, and they're like, "Oh, you're asking about Rojan Z? Don't ask about Rojan Z." I'm like, uh, "Okay." Yep, a couple questions. I'm like, "Okay." So then in Robot Carnival, and they're just like, "Robot Carnival, really?" <laughs> I'm just like, "Also, oh, they're actually like straight up telling you what not to really go with." I mean, that does happen a lot with with uh, Japanese interviews, but it's usually not a little more planned than that. Like you can actually like work in advance and have what they're expecting. But in this case, it's just like, as I'm asking it, they're just shooting him down. And 
I look over at Odomo and he's just like, oh no, let me get that croissant. And I, I got the, I like, I got dibs on the chocolate croissant. And like, and like, I'm now at about three quarters of my questions that I've either asked and just, just torpedoed. And I just like, I think I just look at him. I just shoot him a look like what the fuck, man. And, <laughs> and he just, he looks at, at me and he goes, sorry. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> oh my gosh um, and so I just I, I kind of trudged through the rest of the interview I'm like well that was a thing and I just I just I uh, sudged it up as much as I could in the in the writing of it and I just turned it and I'm like okay let us never speak of that again um, and then so to his credit to his credit now Otomo is very powerful but he's very powerful because of something he made 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, 25 years ago. I'm bad at math. Um, he's yeah, powerful. It's got to be more than 25. You know, you talk yes. about Akira, right? Yeah, I'm talking about Akira. Um, yeah, definitely more than 25. <laughs> okay, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and because of this, he, like, he's really kind of tired of having everyone talk about Akira. It's sort of like, um, I can only relate it to Tomino with Gundam or, um, or, uh, what, what's his name? Uh, Akira. And, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> whenever any of these massive creators peak too early, they get a little bit resentful of it. Um, so when people make documentaries, you know, these terrible documentaries about anime, they always want to cure a clip. And he's finally started going like, you want a clip? Fine. A hundred grand to clear wow. the clip. And so I was trying to make this, you know, behind the scenes of robot carnival. And I, I, I interviewed uh, Jerry Beck, who was one of the guys that released it back in the day. Um, and you know, they were talking about having to kind of parlay it off the success of Akira. So I'm like, I'm making this documentary. I'm like, I really need to clear a clip of Akira. So I go to my friends at Funimation and they very kindly put in touch with, uh, get in touch with Kodansha and they're like, okay, just so you know, Otomo, you know, usually wants a lot of money to clear these clips. I'm like, okay, well, it doesn't hurt to ask. And I wait a couple days and they're like, so you're not just going to make this about him, right? You're giving equal treatment to all the all the other uh, directors of Robot Carnival. I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh yeah, we're just using this to you know historically contextualize it. And he goes, okay, you can have it for free. <laughs> Basically, so he just wants to. He's just like, just don't focus on me, please. Don't don't focus on me and send me a bunch of copies so I can I can give them my to my friends. I'm like, done. Ab absolutely, thank you so much. So <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, Otomo, awesome guy. I just got him on a bad morning. <laughs> okay, well, you know, Tomo, if you're watching this, you, you know, you already know for the rest of it. <laughs> you know. Um, so I guess we should probably get into our uh, final question here. Um, and this is our probably our biggest tradition. And I think I already kind of have an idea because I think you basically kind of lightly touched on it earlier on um, what okay. it was. Uh, what is your end game? How do you want basically like, you know, when you're – basically an old man and you're like i'm either hanging it up or not hanging it up you know how do you basically want your career to to um, have gone um are you familiar with lauren michaels not personally though no. all right lauren michaels is the executive producer of saturday night live um, oh, you know what? I think I know who you're talking about. Then, yeah, I'm like, I wasn't sure exactly at first. Yeah, yeah. and he is extremely powerful, especially in comedy. Uh, I have a lot of comedy friends, so that like the name comes up a lot. Uh, and one thing that people don't know about Lauren Michaels is that his company is called Broadway Video, and Broadway Video is actually one of the biggest video post production companies in New York City. Uh, in fact, when I was at Central Park Media and I was rifling through all the master tapes. Some of them had Broadway video logos on them. Um, they're, they're just, you know, a company that does video production for people. Um, and that's a lot of how they made their, their fortune. And then they were able to use that to kind of do their fun projects with, you know, their, their comedy people. Um, media OCD, I would like to be like Broadway video. 
Um, I really want Broadway. I, I love that idea of doing really good work for other people that can pay us money and then using that money to do fun stuff. Um, the trouble is, and what I'm currently struggling with is the time factor. Uh, you know, how do you find enough time in the day to do both the stuff that you need to do and the stuff that you want to do? Um, so that's my current task is trying to learn how to do that. And, uh, I just, uh, made my first full-time hire in a, in a few years, uh, a guy named, uh, David, who's incredible, found him on Twitter. He's actually lives fairly close by and he is just awesome. I, uh, I've been teaching him how to do Blu-rays, um, and you know, he's got a few under his belt now. Um, and hopefully, and I also have like a team of about three or four people that I work with on the regular that they, uh, they're not full time, but they might as well be in some cases. Um, and, uh, I've assembled this incredible team of guys that can, I, I can't work without at this point. And if I can, if I can make media OCD work with a little bit less of my day-to-day -day involvement, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie to you. July, I just like, I almost hit the pavement. I was just so overworked. We put out so many discs. I think I did 17 discs that month. Um, but then David came on in August and we were able to like kind of, I'm, I'm starting to see how this is going to work and that if I can find other people as talented as the guys I currently got, you know, Mark who does our QC and just finds everything, Logan who does all our, all our subtitles, Caleb who's just this incredible editor. I, I can't wait for people to see what, uh, what he did with um, this behind the scenes we did for Project ACO. Um, if I can leverage a team of people that good there is no stopping us there. Like we will be able to do some incredible stuff. And I really, as proud as I am of our Blu-rays and our repackaging of other people's content, I can't wait to see what we're capable of beyond that. Nice. Well, I mean, I appreciate you guys, you know, putting out, you know, basically for the industry, you know what I mean? Right. You know, like, oh. like you're the reason why we're able to, I mean, aside from like, cause I mean, I'm, I'm, to be honest with you, like, I mean, yeah, we have like Netflix, you have all those different streaming services, but I also like to collect myself, you know, and be able to actually, you know, have like the physical copy of something, you know? I, I appreciate that. And, you know, people, half the people I talk to about Blu-ray, they're like, really? People still buy those? And the other half are like, oh, thank God. Uh, <laughs> but the truth is that over the pandemic, um, anime Blu-ray sales doubled. Um, I believe it. Right, right stuff was, uh, they were as busy as I was. They were losing their minds trying to keep up with demand over the pandemic and, you know, while maintaining safety in their workplace, because, you know, that was a whole moving target. I'm sure it was a logistical nightmare for them. Um, so that said, I don't think anyone really knows if and when Blu-ray is going to go away or if it's just going to be like vinyl and it just has its, uh, has its, you know, dips and ups and downs and eventually becomes like the format that nerds collect and everyone else just streams and maybe already that. Um, but the fact is Blu-ray can only go so far. And then you have to, uh, the whole entertainment world is just in this massive state of upheaval right now. And nobody knows what it's going to look like in three or four years. So I don't want to dream too specifically because um, you have to stay nimble and you have to like, it, it's almost foolhardy to make long-term plans right now because nobody knows what the world's going to look like in another three years. Oh yeah, like you think about like the film industry with the movies and everything like that over this past year, like ah. Right, and guess who just bought Funimation and Crunchyroll? Yep, Sony. They're yeah. all owned by the major studios now. Um, anime is part of that ecosystem now, for better or worse. And we and uh, you know whether I make something anime related or something not anime related, it's all going to have to if not play within that system, at least play in some sort of system that works within it uh, without, you know, ruffling too many feathers. So it, eh, who, who knows what that even looks like? I have no clue. And I don't think anyone does. Yeah, you're right. You're definitely right about that. I can, I can agree, you know, especially think about like Disney buying up everything too, you know, like look at the, <laughs> but they're all like behemoths, but 
Yeah, I, I think uh, th there are companies that I like and companies that I don't, and I'm not going to say which are which, but uh, anyone who follows me on Twitter can probably figure it out. <laughs> I, uh, I, I tend towards adventurous, original, interesting storytelling, and I feel like as many things as we have to watch these days, we don't get that much of it. All right, folks, that's all we have time for because uh, it's uh, it has gotten very, very late. But we got we got in an extra 15 minutes here uh, with uh, Savakis. Uh, you know, if you if you have any handles or media, social medias, you, anybody can check out more of uh, your content from uh, we'll, we'll have it in the, the description for the for the video. Uh, definitely. Uh, Definitely get that over to us. Uh, Shining lights. Uh, definitely, oh, if you want to. Real quick. You know, do want to say, um, you guys definitely want to check out. We're going to put a link down below to the webcomic, The Extras. The Extras is also a part of Imaginos uh, Workshop. You know, it's a comic. Just think of basically um, um, Harry Potter meets um, uh, like the Goonies. That's the best way to think of, of um the extras. It's a, like a 70 page comic. It's a web comic. It's online. Uh, definitely recommend. We've actually interviewed the creator of that um, on the show, uh, Jeff uh, Lilly. So you definitely want to check out that comic. Um, but make sure you subscribe, you know, to the channel for any other interviews that we do. We're basically at the end of the season. So our next interview is going to be the end of the season. I want to thank Justin today for coming on the show. Like I, we really appreciate it. He, he threw a lot of knowledge at us, a lot of history. Um, you know, and a lot about how to be a professional in the industry, you know, and I think that, um, you know, of course, for those of you out there who are interested in kind of wanting to know more about the professional side of things, you know, this is coming from, again, like the founder of Anime News Network, you know, and of course, now the uh, creator or I should say the uh, founder of even um, Media OCD, you know, so, you know, again, you know, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, apologies for the not perfect things on my end. I hope I made it up for you and some knowledge. No, thank I you, greatly you. appreciate it, and thank you again for coming on. All right, take oh. care, guys. Anyway, Shining guys. Lights. Catch y'all later. <laughs>